Uh, after religion and speech, we have press included in the First Amendment. So let's talk about the issues dealing, uh, the issues between the government and media organizations or the press. So we'll be dealing with a lot of issues here where newspapers are trying to print things that the government wouldn't want, and the court has to decide exactly what freedom of the press means. So the freedom of the press is very, very important to a democracy. This is going to be how we get information. Um, and so there's always a struggle between the state, the government, and the press outlets uh, over the information that they spread. So the government has always tried to limit what the press outlets may say, and they'll usually say that this is for like national security reasons. So um, we'll, we'll talk about those issues. There's also going to be issues about whether or not the uh, media outlets have a responsibility to reveal their sources of information. This is how they do reporting, and this is very important to make sure that they're able to continue to report um, and continue to earn the trust of people with information. So um, it, the freedom of the press does not exempt reporters from testifying in court cases. Oftentimes, reporters may be jailed for refusing to reveal where they got information, and so to further... Um, protect the press to to increase the protection of the freedom of the press some states have passed what we call shield laws and shield laws protect reporters who refuse to uh, reveal their sources this protects them from having to go to jail in order to protect the privacy of their sources which pretty much allows them to continue to do their job so if a reporter says like you know i got this information from an anonymous source and they're in the courtroom, uh, they cannot be forced to reveal where that source came from. If they were forced to do so, then if you were a person with sensitive information, you would never be able to trust a reporter to keep your identity safe. All right, so let's get to our first court case here. Here's an issue that we got to understand. Um, this, the issue here is going to be, can the government stop the newspaper from printing something? So uh, in, in this case, this is a very old case, Minneapolis newspaper was about to print a report that uh, would have included details about how a lot of the local government officials were working with the mafia. And um, so this was going to be really harmful to the government here. It was going to expose a lot of problems in the local government. So Minnesota, the state tried to stop the newspaper from being printed. They filed an injunction, which would be a like an order for something to stop happening. And this gets all the way to the Supreme Court, and the court ruled that the government cannot exercise what we call prior restraint. This means that the government cannot stop something from being published, no matter what it is. Um, the government does not have the ability to censor the newspapers. Uh, they may end up punishing the newspaper afterward, but they can't prevent the thing from being ha for the the action from happening. So, near versus Minnesota, not a case we need to know the name, but you need to know the issue prior restraint. Under no circumstance can the government stop something from being printed. So, here's the big deal court case. This is the one we have to know the name of. This is the New York Times versus the United States. So this is another, this is a Vietnam War case. Um, and here the government wants to stop the New York Times from printing something. What happened is there was a report called the Pentagon Papers. And the Pentagon Papers explained that, um, that the government had been covering up the problems of the Vietnam War and that the Vietnam War was actually going poorly. Um, and the New York Times got a copy of this because a worker from the Department of Defense stole them and gave them to the New York Times. So the New York Times is going to print this. And the Nixon administration tried to stop the New York Times from being printed. So this goes all the way to the Supreme Court. This would be a big issue. You know, this would cause a lot of people to mistrust the national government. And this gets all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court follows the precedent of Near versus Minnesota, right? So here the court rules that the report does not destroy national security, and the New York Times cannot be stopped from printing it. Uh, in this case, like 
you know, there is a, a, a worker who steals a report or something like that. They could be punished for that, um, but they can't stop this from being printed. So this is a very important court case because this upholds the prior restraint protection. So here's an issue where uh, the New York Times has a document that the government thinks it would be dangerous if you printed this goes all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court says you cannot, the government cannot stop them from printing this. So another really important prior restraint case. All right, one place where the freedom of the press is limited is the issue that we call libel. So uh, slander is when I would speak uh, false and malicious statements about a person. Uh, we might call this defamation. I'm trying to harm a person's reputation. And that's also not part of speech, but libel is the printed version of, of false information about people. So the press does not have protections when it prints false information about people. They can be held responsible. And that means they could be sued. If the newspaper is printing false information about you, you have a right to sue the newspaper and uh, win damages in court. But it's important that regular people and public officials are treated differently here because the newspapers need to be able to um, to print things that are possibly speculation and that have not been 100% proven. Otherwise, they lack the ability to report here. So this is the, the fact that public officials are treated differently is an important protection for the press. So let's talk about how this works. Okay, so for a public official, um, if the press is printing speculation that turns out to be false, the press is not going to be held, like this is not a problem. This is not something that they're going to be held liable for or punishable for. So here's what happened. This was a, a group of Martin Luther King supporters um, who published a statement in the New York Times about what was going on with Martin Luther King in Alabama. Um, it included some factual errors, like it really it said that he was that Martin Luther King had been arrested seven times when he'd been arrested five times. Sullivan is the police chief of Montgomery. And so these errors made him look a little worse than he actually was. Um, and so he sued. He sued the New York Times, got all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court is like, look, you know, we weren't like intending to like this. This, Even though this was a, a false statement, it was not meant to like destroy his reputation or anything. It was just the information that we had. And so... In this case, New York Times won. The press is protected against libel charges by public figures. If you're a public figure, that includes like a government official, maybe a celebrity, they have to prove that the media outlet, the newspaper, knew the information was false and that they printed it for malicious reasons. So this means that public figures have to prove that the media outlet um, was actually trying to hurt their reputation and that they, they, they knew they were doing something false in order to hurt the reputation. And so this is a really important case that protects the rights of the newspapers to report on public officials. Like not every single detail will always be right. And it's not um, that like the, the newspapers don't do that to destroy people's reputation. They're just reporting the information that they have. And so this protects their right to do so. Um, so this would, this is really important because, uh, libel is not protected for the press, but this helps clarify how libel gets treated. So, um, if you're a public official, you must prove that the news organization was trying to harm your reputation. Another important protection here for uh, for the press and media outlets is uh, what if what if the libel is a form of parody? Uh, so what if the outlet knows that the information is false, but they're telling a joke? And so this is a court case um, between a uh, between Hustler magazine, which is a pornographic magazine, and a preacher, a na national preacher, Jerry Falwell. And so uh, the magazine posted a joke about him that was in a an ad that was clearly a fake ad it was a it was a pretty obvious joke but he sued he sued the magazine for libel because here he like he had the two things he needed he knew like the the magazine knew that what they printed was false and that this was a joke 
uh, at his expense. So he thought he could prove, you know, they have false information and they're doing this to damage my reputation. So he goes all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court sides with the magazine here. So even though it caused him emotional distress or whatever, the goal here was a joke. The goal was not just to destroy a man's reputation. The goal was to tell a joke. And that is the kind of thing that the press, that publications have a right to do. So parody is not libel. In our picture down there, you know, things like uh, often we'll have political officials uh, complain about their treatment on, uh, you know, comedy shows. Uh, and that, that certainly included Donald Trump and his rivalry with Saturday Night Live. But those are forms of parody. Obviously, Saturday Night Live knows that Donald Trump does not actually get advice from the Grim Reaper. Um, and they may be doing this to poke fun at President Trump, but this is a form of parody. And so they cannot be sued for that. All right, the next part of the First Amendment that we're going to deal with is the freedom of assembly, the freedom to associate in groups, to gather in groups, um, express opinions and all this. All these kind of things go together, but this is a, you know, a separate part of the First Amendment, so we want to see where the limits are here. All right, so my words of the First Amendment, Congress shall make no law abridging the right of the people to peaceably assemble. So obviously taking parts there, leaving out the religion and the speech, but Congress will not make a law that abridges the rights of the people to assemble peacefully. So this, um, we often call this the freedom of association, even though those words are not necessarily in the First Amendment. This part of the First Amendment gives us the right to get together in groups. Uh, it gives us the right to coordinate. It gives us the right to act together as groups, to advocate together as groups, and uh, to petition the government. So this is, you know, the freedom of assembly is important. This is what allows us to make political parties or to make interest groups or to gather to protest the government, to ask the government to do something. So the freedom of assembly is not absolute. This does not mean you can get together anytime, anywhere, do whatever you want. Um, so some of the restrictions here are that groups have to operate within what we call reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions. So, um, you know, a protest in a public park in the middle of the day, that's fine. A protest like in the middle of the street um, that closes down traffic or creates a danger, that's not a protected form of speech. People can be arrested for that kind of thing. Uh, you can get together in groups, like you can get together as a political party or an interest group, but you don't have the right to get together um, in a violent group like a street gang or the mafia. Um, we'll see that this is not exactly clear because some groups get protection as well, but um, this does not protect the right of a group to incite violence or to encourage riots. So um, if your assembly is not exactly peaceful or it leads to problems, then you may uh, have your rights restricted a little more. And governments can limit this right for safety reasons. Um, so you guys may remember it was a few just a few years ago, uh, the KKK was upset that we were changing the names of some of our parks downtown. And so they wanted to come down here and have a KKK march. Um, and uh, Memphis had to let them do that because of the freedom of assembly, but Memphis was also allowed to give them a specific place to be and to prevent any crowd uh, from coming to see it and all of that. So we'll, we, we should talk about this live. This happened like right in my front yard. It was a really weird day, um, but the group, because of safety concerns, they can be limited. All right, we've got a few court cases here. We're not going to have to know them by name, but the rules are important. So an older case, Cox versus New Hampshire. Uh, this really is about the government's ability to regulate a gathering. Um, so there were, um, there were in this case, there were some Jehovah's Witnesses. They were marching around, um, and they did not have a permit. And New Hampshire wanted to require permits for assembly, they argued that if they had to get a permit, that they wouldn't actually have real freedom of assembly, that they should be able to assemble freely anywhere, all this stuff. Went to the Supreme Court and the court ruled that governments can require permits in the interest of maintaining order and stuff like that. If you want to have like a march 
if you want to like, you know, march in the streets or whatever, like, and the government says, hey, you have to get a permit for that. That's a totally reasonable restriction on the freedom of assembly. So this prevents, you know, groups from being completely disruptive and all that kind of stuff. They have to go get a permit. They may be like limited as to where they go and things like that. And that is all still allowing you to have your freedom to assemble. All right. Do you have the freedom to assemble anywhere? Uh, Lloyd versus Tanner is another case that we deal with. What if the, pr the uh, protest is taking place on private property? Um, in this case, we uh, during the Vietnam War, this is not what the picture is, but we have a lot of protests that take place at malls. Oh, back when we had malls. Um, so people like to protest at the mall because it's a big gathering spot. You make a big scene. Uh, there's a lot of people there. Um, and, uh, in, in, in cases like that, the mall usually calls the police and the protesters are arrested for trespassing. Uh, the court, this has gone to court in Lloyd versus Tanner here. And the court has ruled that protesters do not have assembly rights in private spaces. So your right to assemble peacefully and protest or whatever may be restricted in private places. Like you do not necessarily have the right to just go into a restaurant and start protesting and not expect any form of punishment or whatever. So the right to assemble not protected on private property. All right, very important court case here. This is gonna overlap civil liberties and civil rights. We have the NAACP versus Alabama. This was in the 1950s. And the NAACP was organizing in Alabama. They were trying to organize protests and things like that. Alabama wanted the NAACP to turn over a list of its members. They said, hey, yeah, you can, you can assemble and all that, but you have to tell us everyone who's in the group. Um, and that went to the Supreme Court. The NAACP did not want to do that. They feared that Alabama would... Uh, harass those people or try to retaliate against members of their group. So it goes all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled for the NAACP. Um, so they have a right to assemble, and they would not be freely assembling or freely associating if they had to turn over a list to the state. So the NAACP does not have to provide Alabama with a list of its members. So this is very important protection for groups. This allows groups to keep their membership secret in order to protect the members of their group. And another court case that protects the rights of groups is, uh, but not necessarily protecting the rights of other people, uh, we have Boy Scouts versus Dale. This is from 2001. The Boy Scouts of America, um, at the time, they revoked a scout leader's membership. Uh, this person was an Eagle Scout and had become a scout leader, and they discovered that he was homosexual, and so they kicked him out. This was Dale. Dale sued. Dale sued, saying that the Boy Scouts of America was discriminating against him, that it violated um, you know, anti-discrimination laws and things like that. It goes all the way to the Supreme Court, and this is 2001. And the Supreme Court ruled on the side of Boy Scouts. Boy Scouts are a private group. So the right to the freedom to assemble belongs to the Boy Scouts. And if they are a private group, they are allowed to control their own membership. They cannot be forced to let anybody into their group. So uh, in 2001, Boy Scouts, uh, their right to kick out members because of their sexuality was protected by the court. So this is a protection for groups that allows groups to choose their own membership and all that. Um, but this, uh, the, this, the Boy Scouts have since changed their, uh, changed their stance on this issue and now allow anybody to be a part of Boy Scouts um, and all that. But this was, this was a, a protection for groups that, that is important for groups at the time, even though the result here was that Dale was discriminated against. All right, that's that is a lot. We have a lot to deal with in the First Amendment. Time to take a look at our bigly ideas here. There's President Trump celebrating the freedom of the press. You know the guy loves a good newspaper. So celebrating acquittal from impeachment number one, celebrating the freedom of the press. There's President Trump. 
And here's President Trump enjoying that newspaper. So here's what we want to make sure we can do after today. we got to make sure that we can compare the types of speech that are protected and the types of speech that are limited. So think about the things that are protected, like political speech protected, symbolic speech protected, even hate speech is protected. Um, things that are limited would be speech that incites, speech that creates a danger, um, it may be, you know, speech that is threatening, things like that. So it's always important to keep those limits on free speech in mind. We'll have to talk about those a lot. Um, the specific cases uh, that we'll deal with would be Schink versus the United States and Tinker versus Des Moines. So those would be the important two. Also, uh, Citizens United, but we'll talk about that more with campaigns. But the Schenck versus the United States says that your speech cannot create a danger. Tinker versus Des Moines that protects political speech of students and protects symbolic speech. Uh, we need to make sure that we can explain how the press is protected. So it's really important that you guys can explain the issues of prior restraint and can explain the uh, issues with libel. And uh, it'll also be important for us to be able to describe the limits on the freedom of assembly. Important protections, too, like the NAACP case and the Boy Scouts case, but also to remember where, uh, which ways the government can limit your right to assemble. All right, there it is, the First Amendment, the freedom of religion and speech and press and assembly and petition. The, one of the most important parts of the Constitution that spells out our rights. And remember, all of those are limits on what the government can do to you. So we have individual rights because there are limits on the government there. Remember the first words of this amendment, Congress shall make no law. So it limits what Congress can do, and the result of that is more rights for you. So we've covered the First Amendment. We've still got a lot to go through in the Bill of Rights here. So we'll move on to other rights that are protected by the Bill of Rights.